God, it was like, I can't wait for that day. I, I want to see his face. It's like, just thinking of God, you know, it's just like, we, we, we think about our loved ones that have passed on, but when we get to heaven, we're not going to be thinking of them. We're, we're going to want to see God's face. That's what we're going to long for, and that's how it came. So I hope this song blesses you as much as it blesses me every time. I sing it, I hear it, it blesses me. You ready? Um, yeah. Oh, 
You know, because I remember in the Old Testament it said that they took, um, they they got a, a, a king got a threat from another king, and he laid he he laid the papers down in front of the Lord. You know, and I'm not saying this is a threat, this is a blessing. Because, I mean, our whole reason, again, for this movie is to, per, is to push the gospel. It's to push Jesus Christ. There's nobody here that's trying to be famous or trying to be superstars. The only, there's only room for one superstar, and that's Jesus Christ. And we, we believe in, and know, we know that when, when um, instead of complaining about the movies Hollywood is doing, it's time to stand up and start making films. I truly believe that, you know, and and I believe that this is this is this is us doing our part. And this is this is to me this is the church project. The reason I say that is I do not want us to think like, okay, this is us and there's Tony and Sylvie doing their thing, or this is us and there's Pastor David doing his thing. This is all of us, you know. So I really pray that uh, as we continue to further this movie to make it happen, that you keep it in your prayers. That, you, that, you, that, that not only the movie, but even us, that we stay humble, that we stay focused, that we stay on, on the path that the Lord led us on when he first gave it to us, because the enemy always wants to come and creep in. And we're just going to pray, and we're just going to lay the movie out and say, God, I don't know how many lives you're going to reach, but let it be meant that you reach for this. That, 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 that is touched because we, there's, there's another thing I want to share with you. Unfortunately, with many Christian films, is they don't even say the name of Jesus in it. I mean, how many sermons would you want to hear that don't ever mention Jesus? And if I say that that's a sermon, it better mention Jesus. There's power in his name. When somebody says, you know, and so it's like, we, we want to proclaim a true gospel. Just because it's a movie, we don't want to water it down. We don't want to make it so Christian that only Christians want to watch it. Because it's life out there. Things happen out there. But we want to be real to what is really going on in life. And we want to be real with who Jesus Christ is too. You know, we can't be preaching biblical, uh, biblical sermons and not have biblical movies or biblical songs or whatever it is. You know, so I just I, the reason I bring it up is I keep wanting to share it with you and let you know kind of where it's going and where it's at and what our, our where what our goals are and what our plans are for this to go forward. I really think that God is going to use um, the House of Rest Church in a major way, and I don't say that to exalt anything. I just know because I mean it's, it feels like every single person here has been really dragged through some really really rough stuff in your life. And there's a reason why we're together. There's a reason why we're here. And there's there's, there's always a reason. God, there, there's some, there's a team that God is building, and I'm just excited to know for what. And I, I'm excited to see what transpires out of it. You know, and um, you know, even even our YouTube channel, a lot of churches post their sermons. You know, and for whatever reason, we have over a thousand subscribers. I mean, there's all kinds of churches, and they'll have like 20 views because maybe you know it's their own church members watching it. For whatever reason, God has has brought people's attention this way, and we're just going along with it. We're just like, all right, God, we're just gonna do us, and we're gonna do what we do. And part of it is music and movies and whatever else it goes into later on. You know, but for whatever reason, I want to use any attention that we have from anybody, whether it's locally in Modesto or whether it's across in Russia, the other side of the world. We want to maximize and use that for the gospel to per to push Christ and Christ alone. So, um, other than that, after this, we have a uh, a potluck at Sister Dana's house. She promises to make big fat burritos. That was her quote-unquote words. She said, so we're going to see, because we're all Mexican, so we're going to know. <laughs> That's a bold statement to a bunch of Mexicans that you make big, fat burritos. So I've, I've made some big, fat burritos in my life. 
<laughs> so, uh, but yeah, if you don't know where it's at, just follow us. Let us know. I'll text you the address. If you have GPS, whatever. So, um, all right, you guys ready? Oh, here I am with the mic again. What? Here, keep that from me. <laughs> They're talking on the mic. I don't even know why. All right. Can we all please stand for the reading of the word? <coughs> We're going to James chapter 1, verse 4. Is it a little warmer this week? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a title for today's sermon, but it's a good one. James chapter 1, verse 4. We'll think of a title after. Lord God, I thank you, Lord, for this sermon. I thank you, Lord, for everything that you do. I pray, Lord God, that I stand aside, that I let you speak, that you speak through me, Lord, because you're the pastor of this church, Lord. You are the pastor, Lord. We are your sheep, Lord, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 4, right after Hebrews. Everybody got it? Uh, James was the half-brother of Jesus. James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Matter of fact, James would make fun of Jesus. But all of a sudden, Jesus was crucified, resurrects, and now James becomes one of the pillars of the church. And at this time, if you remember, Peter was pretty much running the church. I don't mean running it like a dictator. He was the one. He was the guy everybody came to. He was Peter. You know, the stubborn one? And Peter, but at this time, Peter was thrown in prison. So the half-brother of Jesus steps up and says, well, Peter's away in jail, but I'm going to step up. And do what needs to be done. And and, and um, Christians had died already at this time. Matter of fact, James, the other James, one of the disciples, he had his head crushed by a giant rock. So Christians are being persecuted. Christians are getting scared. They're falling away. They're like, hey, this is too much. We're going to go back to the law. This is way too much. So John, sometimes James, people don't understand James because they're like, man, he's like really strict. I don't want him to be my pastor. But you got to understand what was happening at the time. Christians were being executed left and right. So James writes this letter to encourage, but also to, to set things straight. And he says this, as they're going through things, he says, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Actually, let's read from verse 2. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We may all have a seat. He starts it off. This is how he starts his letter. James isn't the preacher that comes and tells jokes. He comes, he writes a letter, and he says, Hey, brethren, you know what? He was kind of joy when you fall into various trials. Whatever you're going through, whatever's going on in your life, have joy in it. Usually that would turn people off and be like, This guy, man, he's a whack preacher. I'm supposed to, he's, I'm, I'm, coming every, I'm, I'm coming to feel good. He says, Count it joy when you fall into various trials. And why does he say that? Because it's a comma after. Verse 2, he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So in other words, to become patient, your patience has to be tested. And how is it tested? By various trials. It doesn't say one. You don't give your life to the Lord and, and all of a sudden you pass this huge trial and everything is perfect after that. It's going to continue. He says, in various trials, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that that testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect. It doesn't mean, that word perfect means mature. 
in Greek. That you mature in the things of Christ and complete, lacking nothing. So he's, it's interesting that he says that. So the reason I bring this up, because a lot of times I think it's, it's, it's perception and how we see things. You know, like, um, sometimes we approach God like this. We approach God like, say, God, we want to have the blessings. And while I'm going through this, just get this, we're going through life, and we're going through something, and, and this, is, this is wrong to say this, and I probably said it. But like, man, I'm going through this, but God is preparing a blessing for me. Anybody ever said that, or am I, am I the only one in there? Yeah, I'm the only one in there. He's preparing a blessing for me. But in actuality, it's the other way around. Or, or he's, he's not preparing a blessing for you. He's preparing you for the blessing. That's more biblical. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is what I mean by that. For instance... Um, a baby, uh, my brother Angel, um, and it's funny, it's not, it wasn't funny at the time, but when he was a baby, when my mom was switching him over from a bottle to a cup, I don't really know why she didn't have a sippy cup. I don't know if they didn't make them back then, but <laughs> he had a cup of Kool-Aid, and he was used to getting the bottle, and oh, you fall back and start drinking your bottle, right? He had a full cup of Kool-Aid. It went back and boom! It went all in his face. He started. He couldn't breathe. He thought he was drowning. It was just a little. It was funny for me, you know, seeing my little brother like that. He wasn't prepared for what my mother had given him. He had been drinking Kool-Aid all along in a bottle, but he wasn't prepared for the cup. And sometimes in our walk, we're not prepared for the cup the Lord gives us. He gives us something. Because we want it, we want it, we want it, we want it. God says, fine. Angel had to learn his lesson. After that, he didn't drink, he didn't do that anymore after that first time that I know of. But sometimes, have you ever noticed that in our walk, God gives us something because we want it, we want it, we want it, we want it, he says, fine. And all of a sudden, what happens? We almost drown. And all of a sudden, we back up. We're like, whew, all right, God. And he's like, okay. Because, you know, he's a parent. He's our father. So he does the same thing. You know, uh, imagine a, a, a child. You could buy a child, a baby. You buy him a, a $500 expensive bike. It doesn't mean he can drive it that first day. It's going to take years before he does. But imagine if you put him on there with no training wheels. What's he going to do? He's going to crash. He's going to fall. He's going to get scratched up. Because he rode something. He got on something that he wasn't yet prepared for. The bike was already prepared. He wasn't prepared for the bike. The blessing is already prepared. Sometimes we're not ready and prepared for the blessing. I'm, I'm going to pick on Christian rap again right now. This is what I have a problem with Christian rap. Is because a lot of times we get saved. And we don't wait to get prepared for that blessing. We want it now. We want it right this second. And we do it and we fall flat on our faces because there was no foundation, no maturity, no nothing. It goes beyond Christian rap. It goes behind, it goes with people that stand in the pulpit. It goes for people that want to accept Christ. Don't get me wrong. We accept Christ. We get excited. We get fired up. We want to just go and start a church. Not realizing that we're not prepared for the cup that God's going to give us. And I think that if we look at it um, in that sense, we can see us probably in different times of our life begging God for a cup that we couldn't handle. How about a teenager wants responsibilities? 
but he can't handle that cup. Some teenagers can. Some teenagers turn 16, they get a license, they're responsible, they drive, you know, they don't pack their cars with their friends and do stupid things, they get a job, and, and they're normal. Some 16-year-olds get a car on the first day, they wreck it. Because they weren't prepared for that kind of responsibility. And this is what James is talking about here. He says, listen, he goes, there's greater things, there's things I need to prepare you for that the Lord needs to prepare you for. But the only way you're going to be prepared is if you go through various trials. Because that will build patience. So imagine our Christian walk being steps, each one a little higher than the other. You know, I've may have said this example before. I remember the first time I drove to L.A. going over the grapevine. Right after you pass Bakersfield, you see this huge range of mountains. And and then you keep driving, and then you pass Bakersfield, and you keep seeing the mountain get closer and closer. I remember that first time. I looked back because it was the sun was just coming up. So I kept seeing this huge mountain. And I'm like, man, when are we going to hit this mountain and start going up? And I looked in the rear view, the sun was going up, and I was already elevated. It's a real slow elevation. You guys see that? And I'm like, oh. I'm waiting to get on the mountain, and I've been on it for the last 15 minutes. So there's a slow, gradual step. That's what I was talking about before, during worship, is that a lot of times we've gone so far and don't even realize it until we look back. But here's the thing, though. It's okay to look back, but not to dwell on the past. There's sometimes, we, sometimes in our walk, we need to reassess where we're at. We need to look back and say, oh, man, wow. I've already taken a hundred steps, and I didn't even realize it. But sometimes we want to run up the steps, and we end up tripping and falling. Instead of learning what we're supposed to each step of the way. You know, like, uh, or even another example is a, a car. I can drive my car very well. Some people can't because it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a four-door, it's a big old car. I can pretty much park anywhere I want. Give me a semi-truck, I won't know what to do. I won't know. I don't even know how to turn. I'd probably end up, the trailer would hit the, every curve or something. I, I don't know. There's a different way. It's a bigger thing. So God gives you something small, and, and then you learn to, to ride that out in your life, and then you get something bigger, and something bigger, and more responsibilities, and more things, and, and, and more things. At first, here's what happens, though. Let's say I, I, I master my car well. I can drive it perfectly, almost with my eyes closed. So then I get a truck, and I hit a few curves. And then I, you know, I, I freak out. I'm like, I thought I was a master driver. This is what I mean. Sometimes in our walk, we can get to a certain place, and then we mature in that, and everything's fine. And we're like, oh, finally, there's smooth sailing in my walk. And then something else comes along. You step another step. You elevate yourself a little bit more, and then everything starts messing up. So we, we back up, and we go back. Instead of saying, you know what, I mastered that, and I stumbled at first. I'm going to stumble a little bit more here, but then it's going to balance itself out. And once I get that, guess what? God wants you to go another step, and another step, and another step. You know, so it's like we can't, and, and what ends up happening, this is why I bring this up, what ends up happening is we would rather be comfortable on this step than walking in tribulation in something that builds patience in further steps. So we never get anywhere. We never go back to the world, but we never mature in Christ either. We're just comfortable right here. And another thing is that um, just because you can handle something, just because I can handle something, I cannot assume that Oscar can handle that same thing. And just because you can handle something doesn't mean, you know, Rudy can handle 
that same thing. Just because I can handle a truck doesn't mean you can handle a truck. Just because you can handle a semi, you know, doesn't mean I can, and vice versa, this and that. This is the problem that we have sometimes. It's not realizing that, and that's again, I believe that's why the Lord showed me that us helping each other carry our crosses. Because what you can handle, I can't. What I can handle, you can't. But together we can do it. That's why it's, it's hard to be a, a, a Lone Ranger Christian. Because what about those days that you're down? Who's going to lift you up and encourage you? And you end up falling away further and further and further. You know, even Jesus understood this himself. If you look at his life, Jesus himself, in the very beginning, if you look at, for instance, say the Gospel of John, it progresses to him proclaiming who he is. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And really soon after that, he was executed. He didn't say that in the beginning. In the very beginning, he would heal people, and he'd be like, hey, don't tell my wife. And then he'd go and preach, and then a big crowd would grow, and he wanted to get away from the crowd. As, as even Jesus himself, because he came in the form of man, he also came in the form of man. You know, we know that in Scripture. So we see that he also allowed himself, like the book of James says, through various trials, it produced patience in him. You know, it wouldn't be fair. Jesus really, because I think sometimes we make a mistake and think, well, he's God, so he didn't really feel the thorns. Or he's God, so the nails didn't hurt him the way it would hurt me. No, it did. The way a nail would feel in your hand is the way it felt in his hand. The Bible says that, that he humbled himself to become a man. So in other words, he also had to build up patience. He also had to persevere. He also had to go through trials. He also had to be tempted. He also, all of these things, because if he didn't have to, if he didn't have to feel what we feel, then it's not fair for him to say, hey, I became a man just like you. So he also let himself be built up to all the way to the point of what happened at the end when he was crucified. But Jesus also understood something else. He understood that his death truly meant life. He understood that his pain and, and, and the whips that he took on his back was going to turn to healing. In other words, everything he went through, the various trials he went through, he knew at the end what the result was going to be. And I think that we have to focus ourselves also and say, I'm not saying, you know, it's having, when James says, count it joy when you're going through trials, that does not mean happy. <laughs> joy and happiness are way different. I'm not saying when you get hit with something that you're just happy. Hey, I'm happy. That's, that's crazy. There's things that you aren't happy about. I can't pay this bill. Uh -huh, joy. Come on. I'm not going to be happy if I can't pay a bill. I'm not going to be happy if something's happening to my family. That's not going to make me happy. But I'm going to have joy that God is building something in me. God is maturing me. He's doing something. And if I can just grasp that and put it in my head, that regardless of what I'm going through, God is, is doing something out of it. Out of my various trials, he's producing patience in me. And that patience, having its perfect work, meaning that, that in it, it following through that you may be perfect and mature and complete, lacking nothing. My troubles, all of a sudden, when you change your perspective like this, you can, my troubles become my triumph. My sadness becomes my rejoicing. My pain. In other words, you know, how can I be glad about good health if I've never been sick? How can you know what a good day is unless you've had a bad day? How, can you, how do you know what a great sunny day is unless you've been in a storm? You learn to appreciate life. As we grow older, as I grow older, I know. I know now. And it's probably more I don't. I know bad days. I know bad situations. That way, when it's good, I enjoy it. I enjoy the goodness. When I was young, I took it for granted. 
But now as I get older, I realize there's little moments that you grasp that i got to hold on to this because you don't know what tomorrow brings. But I know here, through various trials, it builds patience in me. It's these things that build character. Second Peter, if we go to Second Peter, chapter five. I mean, uh, not chapter five. There's no chapter five. I'll tell you where right now. Chapter uh, one. Second Peter, chapter one, starting at verse five. Second Peter. For the end, a really short book. You got it? Not yet? Everybody there? Okay, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith and virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound you, you will neither barren nor unfruitful the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why did I show you this? Because there's this, there's this build-up, there's a stage that we see in verse 5. That we have knowledge first. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of Jesus Christ. And by knowing Him, it gives us self-control. And that self-control turns to perseverance. And that perseverance becomes godliness. And that godliness, it gives us brotherly kindness. And that brotherly kindness to love. We see that there's a stage or a build-up there also. If we can go to Malachi, the very last book of the Old Testament. I want to share something here. Right before Matthew. Malachi chapter 3, verse 18. 13, I mean. Malachi 3, 13. You know, James says, how we are reading, about patience. And I want to, this, this is why I want to show you this. It's really easy to start complaining against God. It's really easy to start blaming God, right? You're going through something, man, God, where are you at? My marriage is falling apart. Where are you at? My kids are not doing who knows what. Where are you at? I thought I'll, I can't pay my bills. I'm getting trying to look for jobs. God, where are you at? It's your fault. And I want you to remember this in Malachi, what God says in Malachi chapter 3, starting at 13. And this is the Lord speaking. He says, your words, they've been harsh against me says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? So notice, you can, in other words, God says, we can speak harshly against them and we don't even know it. God says, you're speaking harsh against me. But you within yourself say, what did I do, God? What am I doing? What did I say? And you have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? 
We go through something, we're going through something in life, we're going through something, and we say, man, it's useless. Why am I even going to church for? Why am I going to Bible study? Why am I even reading the Word? I just go back to my old life that I was in. I just go back. It's easier. It's useless to serve God. What profit is it that we kept his ordinance? What good is it? Everything's going wrong. God, you're not there. Verse 15 says, So now we call the proud blessed. For those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. God, all of these people that don't serve you are succeeding. All of these marriages that don't even serve you have lasted for years and years and years and years. And I serve you and worry you. All these people that don't serve you, I see them buying houses. I see them buying cars. I see them doing all these things, having trips and going to Italy or going to wherever, going to a nice restaurant. And all I got is 99 cent chickens. God, where are you? This is a waste. What am I doing this for? So we call the proud blessed. We say, man, they're blessed. All these people have houses and good lives and good marriages and good families and all these things. Look at them, God. They're blessed. For those who do wickedness are raised up. You're exalting them, God. They even tempt God. They tempt you, Lord, and they go free. You don't do nothing to them. And it feels like every day they're punishing me. But then, in verse 16, it says this. Don't you guys remember this? I thought that was my phone for a second. I forgot how to put my own inside of it. In 16 it says, the Lord says this, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. So those that are fearing God, they started talking to each other. And the Lord listened and heard them. So the book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Oh, this is what the Lord says here. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. But then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wickedness, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. So those that fear the Lord, those that don't complain, those that aren't aren't pointing to God and attempting God and doing all these things, saying, God, it's not fair. Everybody else be, is, is doing great. And the Lord says, listen, listen, you might have not have all the materialistic things that this world has to offer, but you know what? You are my jewel. You are my jewel. You know, you have something expensive. You have a, a jewelry box that you put it in, and once in a while you take it out. You don't even want to wear it because it's so beautiful, it's so rare, it's so expensive. And once in a while you pull out your little treasure box, your jewel box, and you pull it out just to look at it. You look at it shine. You look at its glory, and you're like, wow, this is a beautiful jewel. That's what God has with us. You are his jewel. If you are the, if you are the jewel, if you're in the jewelry box of God, there is nothing better. There's nothing better. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And this is the best part, and I will spare them, as a man spares his own son who serves him. He spares you from what? He spares you from hell. He spares you and gives you eternal life. In other words, I remember somebody, and, and this guy, this, this older gentleman, he was about 58 in federal prison. They gave him 30 years. One time we were having this conversation, and I had, I had three years ago still, or so no, about two and a half years, three years ago, and I was complaining. And he's like, David. Can you please stop? 
I was like, what? Because you're being very disrespectful. I was like, what are you talking about? Because you have how much time you have? About two and a half. Because how old are your children? I told him how old they were. He goes, oh, so you're going to get out, they're still going to be little. Must be nice, David. See, this guy was really rich. In federal prison, you get like rich people that break like big laws. This guy was a multimillionaire. This guy had two personal jets. He's not, he wasn't an inmate just talking. The reason I know this is a way to tell. When people go to commissary, commissary and you buy chips and do that and all that, in federal prison, you get commissary once a week and you get a $280 monthly limit. That's all you can spend, a $280 limit. This guy would max out and he would have two other people he put money on their books so they could max out, and he let them keep some of it. That's how much money this guy had. Every month, every month, he was probably getting $500 worth of commissary like nothing. He had somebody shining his boots every day, had somebody else ironing his clothes. Because people do that's how people make money. They're like, hey, I'll iron your clothes, and you give me some tuna? Or uh, shine your boots, give, give me some Doritos. Or, you know, that's what people do. This guy had money. And he tells me, David, he goes, you know what? I would give you everything I own for your sins. My money, my jets, my cars, my houses, everything. He goes, all of that stuff means nothing to me here. He goes, I'm 58 years old. Am I even going to live to ever see out there? And then he ended with this. He goes, David... Whatever it is, the time you have, just do it. He goes, but in actuality, he goes, you think that I'm a rich man, but you're the one that's rich. Because you have a date. Your children are going to be young, and you can live your life. You can still live your life. He goes, you, David, are richer than me. And this is, to me, this is what the Lord is saying. As we look at all the people, everybody that seems successful, and all these things, and God is saying, listen, that stuff means nothing. That doesn't mean nothing. What means more is the fact that I spared you. The fact that you have salvation, you are richer than anybody that is not saved. So and if we find ourselves complaining, then we need to repent. Because God is the one in control. Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. And he has the last word. And I wanted to share, close out, I wanted to share something with you, a Psalm 146. <coughs> you know, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to have money. I know what it was like to have those things of this world. And sometimes, you know, when it's really hard, I talk with Tony, like, man, money was like nothing. It was like water. But then I start thinking, I remember, like the Egyptians, that they, they would remember the food they had in Egypt when they were captives. They would remember the good things. And they forget the bad. The alcoholic remembers having fun, drinking with his, drinking and being at the barbecue, watching the fight, and all that stuff. But he forgot about spending his whole check on it. He forgot about the arguments with his wife. He forgot about the DUIs he would get. He would forget about those things. All he would remember is the good times. And regardless of how good sometimes my own past can seem, it's a deceiving lie of the enemy. Because everything I have now is Christ. And to have Christ is to gain. Even Paul says it. He says, all of those other things I counted as garbage. Even, he says, I counted as cow dung. Cow poop. He says, all those accomplishments I did, it's poop compared to having Christ. So regardless of what you had in the past, Anyways, right here in Psalm 146, it says this. It says, praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord, O my soul, while I live. I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. In other words, he says, don't, don't trust the things of this world. Don't, don't, don't put your trust in people. Don't put your trust in your career. Don't put your trust in the things around you. Don't do that, he says. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth. These people that makes promises, they're going to die someday. They're going to be in the grave. So what good is their promise? Their promise only holds as long as they don't fall over and die. And the Bible says that we don't know when we're going to go, right? His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, and that very day his plans perish. Your boss, your career, it could crumble. How many times have we, how many companies have we seen? Who ever thought Mervyn's would have shut down? Now it doesn't exist. How many other businesses can we say? How many people trusted in their career in Mervyn's? How many people trusted their career in all these places, but as soon as the economy, what, what happens? Companies collapse. So he's saying, don't put your trust in those things. Because on that very day, you don't even know it's going to perish. It says, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. It says, this is the one that's happy, the one that trusts in God. Whether the economy is good or bad, he's still God. Whether your marriage falls apart or not, he's still God. Whether your kids are on drugs or not, he's still God. Whether you can't pay the bills, he's still God. Whether you lose your job, he is still God. It doesn't change. Nothing budges him from his throne. So what are you going to trust in? Governments come and fall. Empires come and fall. But he's still God. The one who made heaven and the earth. Verse 7 says, the one who executes justice for the oppressed and who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. We can all please stand. So what are we going to have trust in? We have to trust in God. It's good to have a career. It's good to have all the things you have. It's good to have a home. It's good to have security. It's good to have a savings. It's good to have all those things. But when you start putting your trust in those things, that's where you slipped up. That's where you messed up. we got to trust in God. That's why we always say that, God, I love my job, but I thank you because you gave it to me. God, I'm thankful for the savings I have because you allowed me to do that. I trust in you, God, and I trust in you alone. We can't compare ourselves to the things of this world. If we do, we're going to lose. What all, even the rich people, they're competing with each other. They're not happy. Why? Because they don't have Christ. To have Christ is to have everything. So if we have ever complained without realizing it, we need to repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I spoke harshly against you. I blame you for stuff that wasn't even your fault. And if you've done that, I believe we all have all blamed God for something. Why don't we just take a few minutes and just ask God to forgive us? We didn't know. But we read it in his word. We don't want to be those that speak harshly, that hope spoke harshly to him. You don't. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you as we read your scriptures, Lord. This is why we read your word. We can't just pick and choose what we want to hear. we got to read what your word says. And your word says here in the Old Testament that these people spoke harshly against you, and they didn't even realize it, Lord. And maybe we've spoken harshly against you, and we didn't even realize it, Lord. So we come before your throne right now, Lord, and we repent. We pray, Lord God, that you forgive us, Lord. Because as we're maturing in this life, as we persevere, God, that we're going through various trials, as we're going through life, Lord, we pray, Lord God, that you give us the perspective, Lord, that it's building something. 
strengthening in us, that you're encouraging us, that you're building us, that you're giving us perseverance and patience, God, that you're building that and maturing us in you, Lord. But while we go through this trial, while we go through this walk, while we go through this life, Lord, let us not speak harshly against you, Lord. Because we want to be those that speak to each other, that are gathered there, that you say, hmm, there's my jewel. There's my jewel. There is my jewel. We want to be your jewels, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, and we worship you, Lord. Continue, Lord, to, to build perseverance in us as we go through trials every day in our life, every month, every year, Lord. And we know, Lord God, at the very end of all things that you are going to spare us because we trusted and believed in you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. I wanted to share something before we're dismissed. Um, it keeps falling. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to read it, share a song with you as well. I don't have to go there, but just listen. I was impressed by the word that David was speaking today to share this one as well. And uh, I also don't want to pick on Christian rap, but I want to say something about that too. I don't consider myself a Christian rapper. I'm just a man of God who loves to share his heart with his music. A poetic preacher. As some of you might know, back in the day, I, I, I used to do music with David with a group called the Dark Room Family. And uh, there was money, there was fame, a lot of recognition. And I do thank God for that moment in my life for the simple fact that I got a taste of it then. And I'm not seeking for that now. As sadly, I do see a lot of Christian artists doing that today. Maybe they sought that in the world and never got it. So now that they're getting recognition in the Christian rap industry, they look for that. They seek that, that fame, that, that self-glorification, though they may mention the things of God and stuff, but, but still, there's still that, look at me, I'm the same type of spirit. Yeah. So I do thank God, like I said, for that moment in my past, because I, I don't seek that now. What we do, what my wife and I do, you know, it was a blessing the way we met. We met in church. It was part of a crazy team, part of a choir, and I was just a thug off the street that was so ashamed to even speak rap out of my mouth because of the filth that I used to rap about. See, but God had a plan. And when we met and he brought us together, something powerful was born. I do ask you, friends and family at the church, brothers and sisters in the Lord, continue to pray for us, for our ministry. It's not an industry, it's a ministry. We need it. The devil hates what we do. Oh, the devil didn't care about what I did then in dark room because he already had me right where he wanted me. But now, Doing this for the kingdom of the Lord is constantly trying to attack because he hates what we do. See, there's a lot of people that I know who uh, who, who are rap artists who um, can write just like that. It's, they're talented. I'm not one of those people. I can't write just like that. I don't always write songs, but when I do, God uses them. 
Why? I don't know. Only he knows. And I don't mean to sound uh, boastful, self-boastful or conceited about that. I'm sorry if it sounds that way, but it's true. And I don't fully understand why God uses it, but he does. And all I can do is be obedient and just let him do what he wants to do with it. All I do is share my heart. All we do is share our heart. Our hearts. But I want to share this psalm real quick. It is Psalm 74. Psalm of Asaph. Oh God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old. The ch oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Psalm 73. <laughs> Praise the Lord, somebody. Still with me? I like 74 now. Huh? That was good too. It was good. You can read that later. Read it after church. <laughs> Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no pangs in their death. But their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than their heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lawfully. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues walk through earth, through the earth. Therefore, his people return here, and waters of full of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been unto, untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, I was it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. Surely you set them in slippery paths. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakens. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those 
who deserve you for heartfully. I don't know how I'm sorry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. A lot of times, like Pastor David was saying, we look around and we don't understand why the wicked, why the ungodly have all the things that they have. If they curse God, if they don't believe in God or what have you. And here we are with our little struggles in life. I love the part where it says, but when I step into your sanctuary. In other words, when I step into the presence of God. See, a lot of times we may be out of that and we see all that and it starts to bother us. You were talking about repenting from that. Amen, yes. Because our flesh starts to see what others have and what we may not. And it starts to bother us sometimes. But the moment that we step into the presence of an almighty God and he shows us the end, the destruction of, of that way of living and the promises that he has for us in Christ Jesus. It's a beautiful thing to serve the one true God that you trust in him. So repent from those things, yes, always. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all his ways and he shall direct that path. And also, remember, if God is for you, it don't matter who or what is against you. I want to end with this real quick. Real quick. Talking about being transparent. Talking about being human. Sharing my heart in song. This is something that I wrote. It's on the album. But to share a bit of my heart with you, I say this. You see, I, I know I'm called to preach a message every time I hit a microphone. In the name of Jesus, you are God alone. That's why I'm lifting up my hands, Lord. I worship you. Despite of all the trials that I faced, I'm serving you. The truth is, though you already knew this, it wasn't easy for me losing Gabriel Sanchez to his illness. I fell, yes, but nonetheless, I must confess, I know I'm blessed. You see, it was a test for Tony that became a testimony. I hope you realize now this brother ain't a phony. I praise the one and only Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the only one who's able to forgive anyone of anything. Was it all just a dream? <laughs> well, as long as God gets the glory, I'm going to share my story. I, I know somebody needs to hear this. Romans 8.1. Now, let's walk according to the Spirit. Amen. Be blessed, everybody. Well. Lord Jesus, would you please stand and pray out? Pray out, sir. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for today, Lord God. I thank you for each and every person that was here today, Lord God. I pray a blessing upon each yes. and every one of them, yes. Lord God, as they go home today or as they come to the fellowship today, Lord God. I thank you so much, Lord God, and let us continue to be grateful in the things, Lord God, because even though these things are against us, it doesn't mean that all things are against us, Lord God, because if you are for us, Lord, it don't matter who, it don't matter what is against us. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, in the name above every name, Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen. Amen. We're going to put the chairs up and we're going to go to Dana's.